Yeah, welcome and good morning to all of you. Uh, yeah, this morning I would like to give you an update, like every year, <laughs> uh, about the Phase 3E project and uh, what have happened also in the last uh, year, what uh, in uh, what have Ansat DL, well, what was our work over the last couple of months and the main issues. So, uh, yeah, everyone knows uh, it's a long way towards phase 3E with lots of up and downs and it's a bumpy road. I hope at the end of this road there will be the launch, but we do not yet know how long the road will be. But uh, we certainly work hard to drive faster than allowed. Well, a few words about the AMSAT phase 3E project, why we do want to do this. I mean, we all, or many, hopefully many of us, <laughs> remember the good old times of the previous phase 3 satellites, uh, Oscar 10, Oscar 13, and even Oscar 40, which operated still four years before it uh, failed. And uh, indeed, there's a lack of long range uh, and long duration communication possibilities because we all know we, we have a lot of satellites in low Earth orbit, also a lot of CubeSats and other satellites, but there's still a lack of uh, long duration communication which we had before with phase three. And those who remember when Oscar 10 and Oscar 13 were launched, how many activity we found on the bands. And this was really for, not only for the AMSAT groups, it was even for ham radio at all, really a big, big jump forward. And we really miss that. And uh, so one of the objectives is really to bring back the good all times and hopefully give a boost to amateur radio. Yeah, so we are talking about a satellite in a high elliptical orbit, highly inclined orbit. So the phase 3E will have a perigee about 2,000 kilometers and apogee around 44,000 kilometers. So it's higher than the standard uh, geostationary orbit. <coughs> the reason for this is with 50 degrees inclination that we get a 14 hour period. So the apogee will be the same every seven days. So for example, this if, if you have fixed un uh, mounted antennas, you can do the same thing every seven days. Well, also because of the, the orbit indeed, which is some kind of Molnia style orbit we have up to 100 hours of coverage every week in the Northern Hemisphere. And I think that's a lot and makes communication yeah, more calm and you don't have to really run after the satellite. It's the other way around. So, yeah, you may have seen this before. This shows the, the um, Van Allen belt and how the different satellite orbits uh, around the Earth and indeed the high elliptical orbit with our chosen inclination more or less gives you a good combination regarding to the Van Allen belt so that we do not have to spend so much time in the radiation belt. So uh, radiation hardness of parts is an issue indeed, but it's not so bad as most people think it is. Yeah, how do we get there normally? <coughs> We are going into a, a GTU orbit, which is very close to the equator. We, the previous satellites were all launched in South America, so very close to the equator with Ariane. So we are getting into the GTU orbit, and usually, and that's why we have in the past this 400 Newton engine in the apogee, uh, sorry, in the apogee, we usually uh, do the re uh, the motor burns to raise inclination and also depending on the launcher sometimes you also have to raise the perigee otherwise it comes too close because standard GTO with Ariane 5 for example the perigee is around 200 kilometers 
So if you don't get out of this uh, within one or two weeks, uh, the satellite will re-enter and burn up. So that's why you have to have uh, some sort of propulsion. <coughs> yeah, AMSAT DL, as you know, AMSAT was founded in 1969 in Washington, D.C., and the uh, AMSAT DL was launched in 1973. Yeah, and then have a look. On the previous Phase 3 satellites, we had AMSAT Phase 3A launched in, or supposed to be launched in 1980. Unfortunately, it was uh, a launch failure of the rocket. But only three years later, we were able to launch OSCAR 10. Then you see it took a little bit longer to launch OSCAR 13. And 12, another 12 years to launch OSCAR 40. And I hope we will not, uh, it will not go in this curve that we now have to wait 24 years. Uh, so I hope that we see a launch of phase three somewhere around uh, 2012. Saying this, we do not have a fixed launch yet, but uh, we are looking after this. Uh, yeah, a quick view. I think some of you which may not have seen the phase three satellites before. Uh, that was phase 3A on the second flight of the first Ariane 1 rocket in <coughs> 1980. And uh, this was also a very novel way how the satellite was mount mounted to the launch structure. These were the famous fire wheel satellites for scientific reasons with a lot of 50 kilogram subsatellites around. But unfortunately, this was a launch failure. So then we had OSCAR 10 launched with Ariane 1 flight, the six, sixth flight of the Ariane. And uh, also again, we had a special kind of adapter for the spacecraft. And we successfully qualified this so-called system de lancement uh, double Ariane, which means uh, that was already the first time that Ariane was the first commercial rocket allowing two payloads launched at once. And that's here how you can see how it was done. So the ECS-1 communication satellite was on top and AMSAT uh, Phase 3B inside of this adapter, the so-called Zylda. Then we have OSCAR 13 launched with the first Ariane 4 flight in June 1988. And uh, it was not really a test flight. It already had a commercial payload, or two commercial payloads, the Meteosat P2 and uh, the primary payload Panamsat 1 and uh, Oscar 13 as a secondary payload as a third spacecraft sitting inside of this adapter. I think we should have a better view here. Yeah, so quite complex. <laughs> so Panamsat was sitting here, then this Spelda adapter and then inside of the cylindrical adapter, phase 3C, and on top, the Meteosat P2. And finally, OSCAR 40, phase 3D, launched on Ariane 507 in November 2000. That was the heaviest launch by that time ever of an Ariane rocket, with about 6,300 kilograms to GTO. And uh, the most impressive part, I think, is the spacecraft, there were only one primary payload, it was a Panamsat-1, with over uh, 4,700 uh, kilograms, and the, the whole spacecraft was sitting on our SBS adapter. Inside the SBS was Phase 3D, so the SBS was built by AMSAT, it was qualified, but still, the big, huge, million, million dollar expensive satellite, they had to rely on what we were doing. If we have, would have done something wrong, it would have been a big disaster. But indeed, we did everything right, and we convinced everyone by doing quality qu uh, qualification tests. So one SPS was even flown before in space, and we also made some other tests on ground to, to really make sure that it is indeed capable but uh, I will come to later on uh, why this is so important to know. 
Yeah, here you can see again Oscar Forti sitting in this SBS. And this setup was even amounted to the ASAP 5 adapter. So we had, uh, I think, two. Yeah, we had two micro satellites from Britain, from DERA, flying on the ASAP 5 structure. Yeah, and that's how we look forward for phase 3E. There is one picture missing. I don't know why, <coughs> but uh, it was something actually uh, new, a new kind of adapter which is currently under development by Ariane's bus. <coughs> but anyway, we planned, uh, one idea was to use the SBS again and put the uh, phase 3E inside of this adapter. But there are other possibilities, new adapters uh, in, in, in work, where, but similar kind of way to, to launch a mini satellite. In this case, phase 3E would be, for example, inside of this adapter or inside of this one, uh, giving the possibility to be launched either on a Soyuz rocket or on Ariane 5. And we even had talks with uh, SpaceX on the Falcon 9 rocket. And uh, so, yeah, we are doing a lot of talks, actually, or well, we had a lot of talks for the last 12 months, uh, finding space for Phase 3E spacecraft. But indeed, uh, like everyone, also the launch agencies have the problem, the pockets are empty. That's the first you hear from them <laughs> when you come and ask for a launch. But nevertheless, uh, I had some talks recently with Ariane Spass, and I hope to be in Paris uh, next month. We decided not to discuss the money in the first hand. We are now really trying to identify what are the launch possibilities at all, because you have standard GTO launches. It is the working horse, Ariane 5. This is always the same. There is no configuration same uh, change. So they can put up these two satellites one after the other without big uh, money for changes on, on the launch configuration. So that means if someone comes with a new satellite or if we come with the SPS or whatever to put on such a configuration, it's a configuration change. And that means they have to go back to the industry and ask them for a study and the industry asks more and more money for this, and that's a really big issue for them. But sometimes you have satellites which are larger or different than the standard platforms, so there have been changes in the past where, for example, there was one huge satellite on, on, the, on the rocket, and then they have to do a modification, and then they actually have to spend money for configuration change. And if they have to spend this money anyway, then it's probably cheaper and easier to also slip us somewhere into this. So the main priority at the moment really is uh, to identify which launches uh, are candidates for, for phase three. And when we have identified them fitting to our time frame, we will go further and really look, well, how much money really ask, do they ask for? And uh, can we get some government funding actually for the launch? Well, the satellite itself, uh, yeah, honestly, in the last um, year we did not make so much progress on the spacecraft itself because we really had to concentrate on the funding situation because without funding, without our infrastructure intact, uh, we could not continue to build the satellite. Fortunately, uh, some AMSAT organization, including AMSAT UK, helped us out in the past. And that was a really good thing. But uh, we need a long-term strategy, and so we, we really had to work hard uh, to find out what are our possibilities to get funding, say, from German government or something like this. Even together with the P5 deal, uh, mission, we, uh, which I will talk about. But anyway, so mechanically, the spacecraft is ready. We have all the propellant tanks installed. The motor is ready for installation. We have batteries, antennas, the sun earth sensors, uh, solar generator, magnet system. So, and all the little, little parts you see here, and they are a lot. All of them were machined in our workshop in Marburg. So basically, this is ready. 
uh, for the for the spacecraft. Another issue is the indeed are the payloads. That's what we planned. What we see here, indeed, we planned uh, something like we had before UV, LS transponders, but also microwave. Most of the microwave, or basically all of the microwave transponders and receivers, uh, they are ready for launch. They are available in flight hardware. Some of the these transponders are partially ready for flight. For example, all the high power amplifiers are flight ready, which uh, give us about 60 watt PEP on uh, U-band and uh, 38 watt, sorry, uh, 60 watt on 2 meter on B-band and uh, almost 40 watt on S-band downlink. They are ready. Um, we have the L-band receiver, for example, which is flight ready. The mode UV, which which will be basically the SDX, is uh, ready as a prototype, but uh, we need some work or basically uh, Howard is working on that to find uh, support uh, to make it actually build a flight hardware of that. But one of the problems indeed you face is if, if you don't have a launch, it's sometimes hard to motivate the people, ah, get finished, do it. Uh, because it's ah oh, the launch you have no launch and it's ah oh, I have time and ah there are new components I want to do something new and I want to change this and so it's always a little bit hard, but anyway, um, uh, we have to finish the spacecraft to be ready because if we, if we get a launch and we don't run we, the spacecraft is not ready that would be even <laughs> for us. Yeah, about the IHU-3, uh, Mario told you already yesterday about the status of the IHU-3, so I think I can go over that. But as Mario indicated yesterday, the ITA problems uh, was a big drawback over the last years, but fortunately we found, we found Mario, and now, as Mario said yesterday, now he has all the responsibility of the IHU-3, <laughs> but I think it's in good hands, <laughs> so thank you, Mario. And he showed the, his progress yesterday, and I think it's it's a really a big big step forward. So uh, I think we are on a good way here, and that's one of the things on the road which are going up now. <laughs> um, yeah, indeed. When we started thinking about phase three E, that was just after the launch of Oscar Forty, so almost ten years. Uh, we started the planning, the ideas. On the other hand, uh, we have to see. Today, what are the needs of amateur radio? Is, it, is the goal still the same as 10 years ago? So anyway, we all know that uh, amateur, the radio community faces a lot of changes. We have indeed commercial pressure on our frequencies, uh, but uh, also everyone has a high demand, so you have less time to build something by your own. More and more people are using uh, cuts off the shelf, equipment. On the other hand, and we saw also the radio on the USB stick, these SDR technologies and uh, sound cards, processing GNU radio, there's a lot of things uh, really advancing. So we also have to consider how this will influence uh, basically what are the needs of amateur radio in space. And uh, other things like automated operations, APRS kind of thing, whatever. So, but still, this is quite old, but uh, I think it will be more or less the same today. AMSAT NA and uh, AMSAT DL, ours unfortunately is quite a long way uh, uh, ago. But uh, when we made this membership survey, Indeed, a big majority wants another phase three kind of spacecraft. But what we want and what we can afford uh, is sometimes, uh, and this is another story. <laughs> but anyway, so AMSAT-DL was always concentrating on phase three satellites. So low Earth orbits or CubeSats were not really an issue for us. We really wanted to con concentrate on these phase three kinds of uh, uh, satellites. 
yeah, the question is indeed, can others benefit from such a spacecraft apart from the long communication duration and so on? And uh, I think yes, for example, LEO satellite missions could uh, use our spacecraft as a kind of relaying satellite, these TDRS style satellites where you have satellites in low Earth orbit and because they are most of the time they are not in range of their ground station, they could use such a satellite as a repeater, for example, to pass their data to ground stations. Um, another issue is uh, indeed, uh, and you already heard about the P5A mission to Mars and even to Moon, you will see later on, this requires additional skills by the people who actually build, work on the project, but also by the people who later on have the authority to command the spacecraft. So they also need additional training and uh, yeah, learning by doing. And uh, indeed, phase three can also demonstrate capabilities using in higher frequency communication, higher data rates, but also on the other hand, communication formats with uh, well, for deep space, low signal communication, which is in fact necessary for uh, a spacecraft flying to Mars because the signal will be extremely low. For example, by using turbo codes and forward error correction in communication and even by this makes this attractive for other modes and other usage within ham radio. Because as mentioned yesterday, we have this license we got from France Telecom, we did not need to pay for it. We told them what we are doing and they were happy about that. And I think that can be easily extended for by using from for HEMS in general. But at the moment, this license is for phase three satellites and P5A. Well, and indeed, uh, the scientific and educational and even the industrial community will also benefit. Also, sometimes I have the feeling uh, it's not known or ignored what we have done here and what actually are the capabilities of uh, having a sp such a spacecraft uh, also using for university experiments and other things. Well, as I said, it's time to finish phase 3E. Even we have not signed the launch contract yet, but uh, as I said, we need we need a uh, vision. We need uh, really uh, a schedule to get phase three finished. And uh, so, what we are doing in the next couple of weeks and months is that we actually have to make a brainstorming, reconfirm what are the goals of phase three. Is it still what what the members want? Is it still what we want? Indeed. Uh, we have to reconfirm the status of the various payloads. As I said, some of them are flight ready, others are not yet flight ready, and uh, some of them may not appear at all. That can also happen, and so we have to, to look after this and see is it still the right thing what we are doing. And indeed, it might be necessary that some payloads needs to be revised based on, on the outcome of this brainstorming. But, and it is indeed very important that we motivate the people. Our goal is really to finish the spacecraft by 2012, to have it ready for a launch. If we have a launch by then, it's good. Otherwise, uh, we really would put the spacecraft uh, into storage and would be ready when the launch comes up. Yeah, talking about the funding efforts, uh, as you know, this is a really difficult thing because uh, yeah, we can get the funding to actually build the spacecraft, but from what we have seen in the past, launching is another story. And uh, so we actually look forward that somebody else has to pay, basically somebody else has to pay the launch. I mean, it's clear the radio materials cannot pay millions for such a launch if we have to pay millions. There are always a chances to, to get a cheaper flight like in the past, but these chances are getting less and less. So uh, yeah, as a consequence of the bitter findings we had regarding funding, uh, 
it was always the idea to use the P5A mission, the mission to Mars also as a way to help to get phase 3E on its way by using P3E, as I said before, as a test bed for the P5 mission and as an experimental platform, for example, to try out the new IHU to learn how to use it and also the mentioned turbo codes to experiment with this because this, these are the key parts or even of a P5A satellite. So what have we done? Uh, we filed an application to the German DLR, which is basically something like the NASA in the United States, about uh, a spacecraft which would cost uh, around 20 million euro, 10 million euro for the launch and uh, 10 million for the uh, satellite construction and building with the target to fly to Mars and make science around Mars. So the first step was uh, a survey we did together, a study. That was a six month study over the last six months basically, uh, which included uh, two weeks of being in Bremen. Uh, the DLR has a so-called CEF, Concurrent Engineering Facility. ESA has one, DLR also has one now. So they already had designed some mission using this facility, but uh, our project, I think, was a real first real big one. So we, we were together with Hartmut and Achim. So we three were staying almost two weeks, complete working days in Bremen. We spent all of our holiday for that. <laughs> and it was a hard work, I can tell you. But uh, the outcome was very positive because by doing this study, we had somebody else looking on, on our ideas and this is always better because yeah, we know what we want and we know that we can do it. But if somebody comes to you and says, oh, I launched a spacecraft to Mars, we can do this, they, say, ah. they may not really trust you. And But by doing this study together with DLR, we had a lot of specialists. There were, I think, people from 12 different faculties coming in from DLR and really looking on the details. We will see that later on. So for us, it was a good opportunity to demonstrate that yes, such a mission, and that's basically what the outcome of the study is. It's possible, it can be done, and even they say it's a, we should do it, it's worthwhile to do. And it was, I think, very, very good news. So these P5 missions, they are basically now two missions. We have one study, one study was made for, for sending such a spacecraft to Mars. That was the primary target, but uh, since it takes a while, the best launch window for Mars is around 2018, so it's still a long way until then. So DLDA said, ah, how about uh, going to moon in between? <laughs> because uh, you share a lot of technology for both missions. And basically, the moon mission will cost the same like, like the Mars mission. So uh, if you fly to moon or Mars, it's the same price, basically. Same 20 million total. So uh, yeah, launches uh, of, of these missions would be then, as I said, between 2012 and 2018. Uh, the primary launch we are looking into it uh, is uh, indeed Ariane 5. But there's also, even from DLR, some interest. And in SpaceX was also at DLR. Uh, that they buy a complete uh, Falcon launch and maybe put some other, not only the P5A spacecraft, but some other payloads will also be on that one, or satellites. So, uh, yeah, moon orbit will be about 100 kilometers. The exact inclination is still to be defined in, in further studies, but uh, because that, as you know, moon orbits normally are not stable, but there are orbits which are more or less stable, at least where you need less fuel to, to keep them stable. The idea is that uh, such a spacecraft should be at least more than one year. It should do at least one year of scientific, scientific research and everything which goes on top of that is then for our purpose. And for Mars, it's even planned to be there for at least 10 years. Yeah. As I said, and the result of this study, it's not yet decided what they want to do. 
So will we go to moon, will we go to Mars, will we do both, or will we do nothing? That is still under discussion, but anyway, um, just a few weeks ago we, we reported to the di directorate of the DLR uh, with, with the final presentation. This isn't, these are more than 200 pages. It's not really, it's not, uh, not a design study. We really went into the details. Propulsion, communication, and so on was discussed in detail and really designed. So people were sitting there and making calculations. So for example, if the power people wanted more electrical power, the spacecraft gets bigger, you need more solar panels, it gets more heavy, and then the propulsion people start to cry, ah, oh, then we need also more fuel. So this is a lot of discussions and it's it's really, you go really into the details. And at the end, you, you, you have not a flying spacecraft, but you come very close to the final product. And, uh, sorry. And uh, so this, this, this study really at the end says, yeah, we should do this. There, there are many, many good reasons for doing this, and it, it can be done. Now, the DLR indeed is in turn going to the politicians again and basically ask for the money to do that missions because uh, the DLR is only handling the money. They get the money from the government and then they have projects to spend the money and this is indeed a new project so they have to find a new resource for the money and there are at the moment discussions going on with the Ministry of Science and so on and so on. So we hope uh, that later this year we make good progress in this regard and we already talking about going to the next uh, phase of the study, so that was phase one. And in the phase two, you even go and refine these things uh, in more fine grain level, start even designing uh, some prototypes and so on. And I should have mentioned, we for this study, we received 100,000 euro, and we put that into the ballot of uh, AMSA TL to make sure that we keep can continue working on phase three in the next time. So this DLR study, as I said, was more than six months. So really, basically, we had no time to work on other things. But uh, in another approach, we, or in we, we also tried to approach the politics and find out, can we get support from them? And uh, the guy on the left, you know, but the guy on the right side, that is, the <laughs> that is a federal, our federal coordinator for all the space activities in Germany. So basically, he is directly, um, yeah, uh, directly sitting behind the, min uh, the minister. So it more or less, it's, it's the furthest you can get to, to really, uh, yeah, Right. So, uh, yeah, so we actually, Mr. Hinze was thinking about flying to moon before. He proposed some moon missions which were wiped off because they were talking about 1,000 million euro for such a mission. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> which they had not money for. But anyway, so uh, when when he was re-elected earlier this year for his position, we thought, ah, maybe we should write a nice letter to him, congratulate him, and so on and so on. And <laughs> yeah, and uh, to, to our biggest surprise, one week later, we got a reply <laughs> from him and saying, yeah, he read, and we also sent some of our leaflets, and he found that very interesting, and he would like to meet us, and so, Within a couple of weeks, we arranged a meeting in Berlin, in the directly in the ministry, to yeah talk about what have we done in the past and all these kind of things. And for me, it was really a big surprise. And when you go there, meeting such a person, you are always ah, mm, do, do we tell the right things, <laughs> you know? And it was completely different. He knew more about Amsat than we thought. <laughs> <laughs> He was very well informed even about ham radio because once he, he, well, the first thing he asked us was, is ham radio still on shortwave and so on and so on? Yeah, what? 
Yeah, and then he confessed, uh, he asked several questions, we found out, yeah, he said uh, when he was young, he also wanted to make his uh, license, him license. He never finished that because I think he, when he went into the politics, he had enough other things to do, but I think he had some basic information, uh, idea about him already, and uh, during my presentation, I showed about the history of UNSAID, what we have done, and I also mentioned Oscar 21, and some of you remember that on Christmas we played this famous Christ German Christmas music. And then I said, to him, ah, but music is normally not allowed. Yeah, yeah, I know, it's only a test tone. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, he was really, he really knew what he was talking about. So that was, was very good. So it was the, the discussion, continuing discussion was more open. So we were talking about phase three, but ah, yeah, yeah, continue, continue faster, faster, faster. <laughs> so we, we really came very quickly to the point, and yeah, so uh, we had indeed he has a problem here. He has no money to spend directly, <laughs> but uh, he, he can help us in some regard to contact the correct people, and uh, and even he gave us some ideas what we should do, and uh, so basically I cannot go into too many details, but. For us, really, Hartmut was with me. We were really surprised how positive this meeting was, and they really knew a lot about. And we have so much reputation. I mean, uh, after more than ten years, we thought uh, they don't know about Amzat, but yeah, we were really surprised. So we really have, and that's what he was saying. Yeah, he talked to some of his specialists, uh, also at DLA, and oh, Amzat, oh yeah, these are great people. They are doing fantastic things. So. So we hope this is now a door opener for us and we already contacted with this help some people and try to find uh, what kind of funding is possible. He even asked some nasty questions, sorry, I'm running out of time. As one of those questions was, yeah, he asked, why did you ask for funding over the last 10 years? You have not made any request for funding. I said, what? <laughs> 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 yeah, because the situation, we tried indeed to get funding and we were always blocked because, yeah, I mean, nowadays the satellite is nothing special anymore. And if you're not really in the details, you don't care if it's a CubeSat or if it's uh, whatever. So uh, it was hard to get funding. F and we, we asked for funding, but uh, you did not really got through the right people. Hopefully this will change now. And that's why I mentioned we might have to rethink about s some payloads because if you get funding, you cannot get funding for a project which is already started. So it must be something new for them. So we are looking into that. And one of the things was even he said, uh, ah, maybe we can make the launch the out. Uh, we can make a project, uh, 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 the launch is a project. <laughs> but anyway, so he had some specialists with him, his personal advisor, and uh, it was really, we must help them. <laughs> so, for us, it was a very big motivation. So let's see what comes out of this. Oh, by the way, um, as a present, we gave him a DVD. That DVD has audio snippets recorded in Bochum with a 20 meter dish of the original communication from Moon to Earth. Original tapes, not the tapes retransmitted by NASA because the, where, where you have this beep, it's missing on this one. And there you know that these were really coming from Moon. So anyway, he appreciated, appreciated that a lot. Yeah, okay. I go over this. A few things about uh, Bochum. Uh, sometimes people ask, ah, why are you doing this, these experiments from Bochum? Why are you doing, for example, in 2006, we received Voyager over a distance of 14, almost 15 billion kilometers. What can the normal, what is the benefit for the normal hem? What, how does it help phase 3E? Yeah, for us it's very important because indeed uh, the 20 meter dish is, should also be the ground station for our Mars and Moon mission. And uh, if you want to, go into serious talks, you need a uh, good reputation. And that's what we are really doing here. First, we demonstrated we have big ears. We can really receive objects far, far away. 
which normally only DSN can track with their big ears. So we see the, the carrier of Voyager is here, this peak. So we sent the QSL card to the Voyager team and these are all the famous people from, from JPL. They were really surprised that someone comes says, oh, we received Voyager 1. <laughs> so they appreciated that a lot and sent us back this nice picture. Then you also need a big mouse. <laughs> this one indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Carl looks really small with this one, right? <laughs> so uh, we also did the EVE experiment. So we used a lot of uplink power, 5 kilowatt at 2.4 gigahertz into our 20 meter dish. We transmitted signals towards um, uh, Venus and we received uh, the signals back here in Bochum last year. So this demonstrated, yes, we can hear, and we also have enough power to really go over these distances. And the, the five kilowatt amplifier, basically, that will be the command transmitter for P5A. <laughs> 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 yeah, and why we did it on March, uh, March 2009, that was when Earth and Venus came very close, and that was a good opportunity to do this test, and basically, only in this period it was actually possible or Carl calculated that it should be possible to do this. So we can receive, we can transmit. The next thing is automatic operation. Probably not many of you know that we are running the station in Bochum for over one year now fully automatic. So. Uh, some of you know there are these stereo A and B and even A satellites observing the climate, the space weather. And the stereo people, they once had the problem that uh, they have a lot of data coming from their spacecraft, but they have limited downlink time on the NASA Deep Space Network. And a couple of years ago, they asked people with capabilities if they can support them to download the data from their spacecraft. So actually there are maybe around five ground stations around the world helping them out. One is here in UK, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Then in Japan, the National Institute of Information Communication, Toulouse, then DL0SHF in Kiel, and also our 20 meter dish in Bochum. And uh, on this slide, you can see the coverage. So uh, red is uh, stereo A and blue is stereo B. They are in opposite directions. And uh, DSN is a deep space network. When they have access to the spacecraft and these are the other ground stations, and you see Bochum already on this quite old slide pro uh, provides a lot of data to them. And in the meantime, Bochum became even the most, the most important ground station for them because uh, with the help of James Miller, we optimized our demodulator and we can even with very weak signals, we can still decode the data and deliver it through the server in the United States. But as I said, we are doing this free for them, free of charge, <laughs> 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. But for us, it's really good to see how can we automatically run the station? How can we do the remote control? And uh, the owner of the dish, basically, Thilo Elsner and his EOZ, he said, never before the station was running so much and so intense like now. So we really, we use it more than ever before. <laughs> so, and as I said, we urgently need these things for promotion, for reputation, when we talk to DLR to show, yeah, we have the capability, we can do it. A uh, recent uh, thing was the launch of uh, a Japanese H2 rocket towards Venus. Uh, the main payload was Planet C, 
Venus Climate Orbiter or Akatsuki, then uh, the solar sail, Icoros, and uh, the Unitech One satellite. And uh, indeed, you know that I think one year ago, the Japanese group uh, asked, asked for help in receiving Unitech One. So we had the first contact with the group uh, in December 2009 which is not far away from the launch, anyway. And uh, so the spacecraft was supposed to have a so-called CW telemetry. Most people thought that it's CW, but it isn't CW. It's just uh, on-off keying, one bit, a high bit. A one is transmitted to the carrier, and the zero is no carrier. So <laughs> very simple. Uh, they were transmitting on uh, C-band. And they had two patch antennas on the opposite sides of the spacecraft. So uh, probably with a lot of fading. Anyway, so we, we thought, OK, with about 10 watt output power, uh, it should be possible uh, to follow it up for about 30 million kilometers, which is not much because uh, it was already clear n nobody will be able to receive the spacecraft when it comes close to Venus. But things uh, became even worse, we, we will see. Anyway, so we were asked for help, and uh, we were a little bit curious about it. And that's uh, the reason why we never talked officially and loud about uh, what we are doing. But anyway, j uh, the Japanese AMSAT, JAMSAT provided two feed horns, which we installed in, in the uh, center of the 20 meter dish. We also got uh, the special modified Kuno converter for 5.84 gigahertz, which is also locked to our, we have a rubidium 10 megahertz reference clock. So the, f the receive frequency is extremely stable, which is necessary if you want to do deep space communication. Anyway, we had another meeting with the Unitech uh, team leader for the ground station then in April at our symposium. And that was a big shock for us when we learned that things are uh, even a little bit, yeah. So the bad news we found out was that the transmitter could not operate uh, continuously. Uh, so there were long transmission pauses because of the high power consumption of the power amplifier. I think they used the commercial power amplifier. And as I said, the output was in the order of 10 watts, but the input was in the order of 50 to 60 watt. So the spacecraft could not support this over time. The battery would drain empty. So they had a special cycle of transmission periods. And but yeah, then we found out good. Yeah, but this kind of cycle is not good if you want to dis detect uh, weak signals. You had the CW. You had the frequency instability. So it was clear we cannot use integration techniques, which we used, for example, for EVE or Voyager. So. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the transmitter, the master oscillator, really had a huge frequency drift. So when we learned that, it was clear that we would be able to detect this, the spacecraft uh, just behind the moon, and then it's over. Anyway, so uh, the launch was successful. Our friends in Japan were able to receive signals from Unitech within the first six hours, but the signal was very bad, very unstable, more unstable than we uh, anticipated, so there must have been a hardware problem. And uh, when the spacecraft was supposed to be visible here in Europe, about 10 hours after launch, there was nothing. So something unfortunately happened and the spacecraft was completely dead. And without the possibility to track the spacecraft and to for example, determine Doppler effects and things like this. Uh, nobody is could uh, follow the spacecraft anymore because if you want the deep space, NASA deep space networking network looking after your spacecraft, it will cost millions. And they planned to do that by their own, even with our help, which we offered indeed. But uh, without the signal, and it was important to have the signal really within the first few days because the orbit will change quickly <coughs> and with a beam width of uh, less than 0 0.015 degrees. If the spacecraft is not where we expect it, it's gone. So, yeah, unfortunately, that turned out to be 
at the end a little bit frustrating, indeed for our Japanese friends more than for us, but still I think we learned a lot and it was not a waste of time, at least not for us. We verified our system to be also ready for C-Band, so we also have C-Band capability now from Bochum. And uh, yeah, we were able to receive Akatsuki, Planet C and Icarus with extremely strong signals. So when you don't hear the signal from Unitech, we were thought, oh, did we made something wrong? So we double checked twice and also we have our friends from Denmark looking after, so they also heard nothing. So then we said, okay, let's try, let's tune on expand to Akatsuki and Icarus and see if we can hear them. And we turned the frequency on, <laughs> extremely strong signal. So, yeah, so the pointing was correct and yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I will speed on a little bit. Just a few words about P5A, there's always a question uh, what can the normal amateur do with P5A? We will use a 20 meter dish, but what about the 60 centimeter dish? And Achim did some calculations about, so in this axis uh, you have the distance in astronomical units, and here the uh, time frame. So, and this is basically uh, showing when should we, or what kind of dish do you need to receive the spacecraft. And the good news is if you have a 1 meter 20 dish, you are capable to receive the spacecraft basically all the time. And even with a dish less than 60 centimeter, out of a uh, period of 26 months, you still have nine months where you should be able to detect signals even with a 60 centimeter dish. And I think this is something I can imagine a lot of people are really interested in trying this because you can do that from home, point, point your dish to, uh, to uh, Mars and see if you can really receive the uh, signals. Yeah, okay, I will skip this. This is one of the things we plan to do with P5A, using it as a communication relay for scientific uh, purposes. So I will just, I hope I find it, Graham. Uh, well, there's one thing I wanted to show to you is first uh, one recording of Unitech made by our friends in Japan. Uh, no audio? Yeah. What do we have to do from the beginning? I will start from the beginning again. So I told you about the frequency instability and what you will hear if you can hear it. It's one of the one bit signals. <laughs> that was a one. <laughs> For Mario. Imagine if that signal becomes weak, then very difficult. Uh, how well many minutes? Time. Out of time? I go very quickly to that. So <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> I think I think that's the reason why they why you always put me in the first lecture on <laughs> Sunday morning. <laughs> you let me sleep. You didn't let me sleep too much last night, so this is my <laughs> return. <laughs> 
So anyway, so this is a, this is an official presentation from the DLR at the scientific assembly recently in, in Bremen called COSPA 10, Germany's options for moon satellite. And I just wanted to show you, um, I go through this a little bit. So this was a talk from them about us, not from us about them. So you see the good reputation we have so about the things we have done before. Indeed, what is the background about DLR, which is the National Research Center for Astronautics Aerospace in Germany. They have about 6,500 employees, 29 institutes in 13 different locations in Germany, and they have done missions like Cassini, Huygens, Mars Express, and so on. And indeed, the goal was to do to go Mars with AMSAT DAO P5A mission. And uh, so below you see the pictures from the uh, CEF in Bremen. So Bremen is located here, where we were sitting together for two weeks and really working hard on the design. Also, the, the pictures really don't show it. The room was about the size of this room. And uh, as I said, we had about 20 people for every facility from communication, propulsion, project management, and so on. So this is the first design outcome, how, how the spacecraft for the moon will look like. And as you can see, it looks very similar to P5, uh, sorry, to P, P3D, with only some small modifications. We will have the more or less the same propulsion system which we have flown before. We will have three action reels for three axis stabilization. We will have F, we will have L band, S band communication. They will be double redundant. We will use uh, the yeah, scientific frequencies, but we will also use ham frequencies so that also amateurs can actually make use out of this. Um, how do we get to the moon? Usually you can go this the classical way, which is a Hohmann transfer. You know about this, I think. But we are thinking about doing a so-called weak, st weak stability and boundary uh, transfer, which takes much longer, but which costs less fuel. So you can have more payload on the spacecraft. So this will be the distance here will be about 1.5 million kilometer compared to the moon which is normally about 0.4 million uh, kilometers. So, um, but that means normally you go to the moon within five days. In our case, it will be 80 to 120 days. And the agreement will, all the critical maneuvers will be more or less operated by the DLR using the DLR ground network because they have more uh, safety reasons, uh, um, redundant backup, and so on. So in when we are doing these critical maneuvers, the DLR will be in charge for the commanding, receiving, but uh, the AMSAT network will be used as a backup. But uh, during these long transfer periods, because time for them costs money, the agreement is that during those long periods, AMSAT will be in charge, and the DLR will be back up. Yeah, so it's, uh, you see we really went into details, optimizing how do we get to the moon in the best way. Um, some instruments. We will have a so-called video imager system, which will be capable of doing HDTV uh, pictures, movies and the camera can be rotated in all the axes. So the idea is uh, to take images from the moon in real time. For example, the Earth raising above the moon. You have seen that probably before. And uh, transmit this directly to Earth. And this is not a joke. This, this is really serious. And they, they think about this. They loved the idea that um, basically everyone can be able to receive the video real signal from the moon on Earth with a small antenna. So the idea is basically to use a small dish antenna and to use a normal DVBS satellite receiver to receive 
these pictures, free TV from Moon, that is our goal here. So uh, to bring this science into schools and so on and to, to see, to give people the idea what, what's uh, all about this because very often pictures tell more than, than the written word. Well, there are other experiments planned, radiometer for example, we have this Mortis experiment, Bosch for, it's a panoramic optical sensor which is planned to be used for meteorite impacts on the backside of the moon, for example. And these images will be transmitted to Earth and every radiometer will be able to download them. Okay, so I think I better stop now. <laughs> I, I think, uh, yeah, in the next week we are at the moment in the process to cut these 200 pages final report into small pieces, concentrate the information, and publish it in our AMSAT-DL journal over the next, uh, I guess, year <laughs> because <laughs> it's so much information. And uh, I'm pretty sure we, you will see this uh, also in your magazine later on and I'm pretty sure we will talk about this with hopefully more good news uh, next year. So thank you very much. Sorry for what I think you know about this. <laughs> Yeah. We really have got no time for questions. That Peter was here for the rest of the day. If, has anybody got a really burning question? I've got about ten, but I'm going to keep people up. Peter, thank yeah. you very much indeed. That's thank you. I, I've heard you speak about uh, AMSAT DL many times, but this sounds to me one of the most interesting and optimistic <coughs> presentations you've yes. given, been able to give yeah. for some some years. So congratulations I, I, I can to only say DL I'm for everything yes, that you. you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I have a prize. Oh. <laughs> a special ah. a special fun cube badge for thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank I'm you very much. Indeed. I will fix it.